a long-term artificial intelligence enthusiast. I was a computer scientist. The first job I was offered was a job in a company building robots in London. Unfortunately, the company failed before I even got in for the first day. So my second job was working on a large military project building artificial intelligence systems as well, which I'll talk about later. And that, this has been my interest throughout my life. Unfortunately, it's only in the last few years that that interest has become something that you can, you can make money out of and have a career out of unless you're very lucky. But let's have a look, what is artificial intelligence? So some people say cynically that artificial intelligence is anything that computers can do, it ceases to be artificial intelligence. Yeah, so computers, chess, chess was considered an intelligent thing, Computers can play chess, and therefore chess is not intelligence. Um, the opposite of this is artificial intelligence is when you get machines to perform tasks that people normally do. So you can see th these are two sides of the same argument. Artificial intelligence is basically the frontier of computers doing things. Um, and more specifically, I think, artificial intelligence is solving problems in complex environments. Now, Tayara is a complex environment. There's large amounts of data, there's people, there are complicated interactions, um, and trying to satisfy people's requirements is a very complicated problem. So it's a problem well suited to an artificial intelligence solution. But there's a lot of hype with artificial intelligence. A lot of people talking about it as if this is going to change the world, as if we're going to have you know, walking, talking robots soon coming to take all our jobs and so on. But this has happened before. We've, we have this idea called an AI winter, as in Game of Thrones, winter is coming. But this is an old idea. From the 1970s and in the 1990s, artificial intelligence had become the thing that will save us all, and then suddenly it was failed. And what happens is we get a lot of hype, so a lot of people saying artificial intelligence is great, followed by no delivery, followed by the money goes, and then everybody goes and works in another field. So this is the fear in the artificial intelligence world, the, the concept of the AI winter. And now we are possibly in another hype cycle. So everybody is saying artificial intelligence, machine learning, this is the solution to everything. And we fear that we will end up back in another winter. But I, I think it might be different this time. Why is it different? Moore's law. Moore's law being the the number of transistors doubles every one and a half years. But in reality, when I say Moore's law, what I mean is the exponential growth of computing. The fact that we have faster computers at the same price point every year. So the project, the first project I worked on was a military project, and the idea was to shoot down nuclear missiles in space. So there's a nuclear weapon launched at Britain, and we want to shoot it down with something. And the scenario was a Russian submarine launches all of its missiles at England. But when it does it, it fires a bus, they call it a bus. The bus can, comes out of the, out of the missile, and it, the bus contains all the warheads, but it also contains decoys, it contains rubbish, it contains balloons that look like missiles, covered in aluminium. It contains balloons with little motors, so they move correctly even when they hit the atmosphere. It releases clouds of aerosols, which affect the chemical sensors, and one submarine will produce, we thought, about 24,000 objects. So, from the launch, 24,000 objects appear on our sensors. Now, to shoot these missiles down, we can't shoot 24,000 objects down. What we want to do is we want to shoot the 20 actual nuclear warheads down. So to shoot the nuclear warheads, all we need to do, a simple problem, is work out which of those 24,000 objects are a problem, and then shoot them down. You have three minutes. From the time the bus deploys, you have three minutes to make your mind up. What are the real targets? And after three minutes, it's too late. You've missed your opportunity to shoot these things down. And with the fastest computers in the world back then, it took us 24 hours to decide which were the real targets. The maths was fine. We could do the maths. These were Bayesian networks and basic neural networks. But it just took too long. But what's interesting to me is that the computers we worked on, which were Cray computers, which were, as I say, then the fastest computers in the world, a Cray computer of the sort we had then is less powerful than an Apple Watch now. 
Yeah, that 24 hours, if you think about it with the Moore's Law doubling, 24 hours goes to 12, and then down to six, and then down to three hours with each doubling, one and a half hours, um, 45 minutes, 22 minutes, 11 minutes, five minutes. Basically, one, one decade is enough. One decade of Moore's Law is enough to take a problem which was unsolvable and make it into a real world solution for Moore's Law. The other thing is big data, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, these companies have massive amounts of data. Now, machine learning is the new AI, or the, the main modern AI. Machine learning is statistics, and for statistics we need data. To have statistical significance, or to have some value in our predictions, we need to have data. So the combination of Moore's Law and big data, then there was one more thing required, and that was improved algorithms. When you took, what a, what a neural network does, a machine learning system, is it takes features. It looks for features in the data. Each layer in neural networks then looks at the previous outputs and tries to extract slightly more abstract features. And with each layer down, the features you can abstract are more complicated and therefore more useful. So to do modern deep learning, we need very deep neural networks. And it was then Yang Lekun, who is now, this, in fact, is, Yang Lekun is French, isn't he? So, Yang Lekun is the director of research for Facebook AI now. Yann Lacoon came up in the 90s with the ability to apply backpropagation to a deep network. So he did the maths that enabled us to make deep networks where we put the output of one layer into the next layer. So those are the three things. Moore's Law, Big Data, and Deep Learning. Those are the three things that have changed the world. Why have they changed it? Because unlike in the 1970s, and unlike in the 1990s, the current AI systems make money. Yeah, Google makes a lot of money. When I was at Google, 30% of all the computing cycles run on, on, the, on the 5 million Google servers, 30% of those servers were running AI models, machine learning models all the time. And I left a year and a half ago, I suspect it's probably more now. <coughs> yeah, Google, Google, while I was there, redefined itself as an AI company. Yeah, it's not a search company, it's not an advertising company, it's an AI company because AI is the foundation of search and of advertising for Google. Okay, so what do we use it for? Basically, we use it for personalizing. Everything we do is about personalizing. When we do search, if somebody is searching for something, we want to understand what their query means. And by that, I mean, we want to understand what they wanted, not the words they typed in, what did they want? From the history of all the interactions of this person, from other people who are similar to this person, what type of results do they click on when they enter this type of search? And that's a big data problem, big statistical problem. Recommendations. In Tayaro, we might say to you, you search for this, here are some similar products. That, that is a machine learning problem, working out what type of things might be useful to somebody. Not what you search for, that's a different question. What, what might we show you? Netflix, perfect example of it. Amazon, another example. We, we look at people like you and your history and try to work out the ideal advert to show you. Before, before I went to Google, I used to be paranoid about privacy. I hid all my data, no cookies, no tracking, everything. And once you take Google money, you think this is, you can't do that, that's typically the So I turned it all on. And actually, my internet experience became better because Google started showing me adverts for things that I might buy instead of adverts for completely random things that were nothing to do with me. Um, Personalisation, I think, is a good thing. And then predictions. What will the stock market do tomorrow? What will be the effect of Brexit? How much money will we make? These, how much money will this user contribute to us? What type of user will this person become? These are all predictions. And again, this is statistics, applied statistics, which is all machine learning is. <coughs> Here's a project I was involved in. A big hospital in London has operating theatres, so they, they do surgery. It's a children's hospital, they do children's surgery. Then in a, another bit of the room, we have people who decide the beds. They work out how many people they can bring into the beds, who's going in into the beds, who's going out of the beds. They do it on cardboard, pieces of cardboard on the wall. And what happens is 30% of operations are cancelled on the day, because when the child gets to the hospital, they look at the beds and they say, not enough beds. 
Now this is a crazy waste of resources. A surgical team has to do no work for the afternoon because there is no bed for it. So that was a statistical problem, working out how to satisfy all of the constraints necessary to do it. That's a great use of AI. On Tayara, yeah, search, okay, it's all the same. The search on Tayara is able to take multiple signals, and it, it works in the same way that Google search works, just on a smaller scale because it's a smaller data set, which is you take, you take the search query and you take the existing data and you give that to multiple different systems and each system tries to interpret it in a certain way and then you amalgamate all of those answers back to give you a list in order. Now yeah, Google it's about a hundred different systems, spelling, checkers, synonyms, um, his, your history, other people's history and so on. And Tayala has a similar approach, which means that you don't get a search rank simply by the most recent you get a search rank by the likeliest to be clicked on, i.e. the most useful in that order. Fraud. Big thing on fraud. It's people trying to subvert and avoid the rules. People trying to sell things by having a photo of one thing but a description of another. People posting the same ads on different accounts to get around paying the appropriate fees and so on. There are lots of areas where fraud is used. So there's a ship's dead, the, the company, which I'm from, but which we're involved in now. We have a module called Serenity. Serenity has a fraud detection capability, and it's all based upon machine learning, on looking at the images, on looking at the text, and working out which adverts are likely to need investigation. Similar ads. You, you, put a, you say, I want a shirt. You find a shirt, but we can then show you similar shirts. And that is a machine learning problem. We look at the images, we have to identify that that is a shirt, and then we say, shirts with similar patterns. What is a similar pattern? Well, in reality, a similar pattern is a shirt that somebody clicks on. So that's the most important thing. Um, and that's a learning process. The machine learns based on the data and based on the user behavior all the time. Automatic categorization is a simple one, but a, a, an obvious one. When you, you take a photo of something, if you put it in the wrong category, nobody will buy it. If you, if you try to sell a phone, and it goes into the car category, nobody is buying it because they won't see it. So we try to suggest that that is a phone and therefore it goes into the phone category. If it doesn't, then the fraud detection system is interested because why are you doing this? And then the a final one is, is on, on a lot of apps, and on Tayara now, but this will change, you can't complete the transaction in the app. You cannot pay for the item in the app. And if you can't pay for the item in the app, how do we, the company, know that, us, that, that the transaction finished? That, that person A bought an item from person B? How do we know they do that? One of the clues we have is the chat system. People are talking to each other. So we have machine learning systems that read the chat, and all they're looking for is the signal that says, I will come to your house at 7 o'clock to collect it. Or, you know, great, I'll pay 100 for that. So the machine learning systems can read the chat and work out a clue that the transaction has been completed. Okay, so that's, that's AI, but that's, as I say, that's machine learning, that's statistical machine learning. And that is what we use in Tayara and it's what we use in most modern applications. But I'm just going to go a little bit wider now, we talk real AI. So we have, we have AI, and as I say, AI is mainly statistics. But then there's a thing called AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. So what's the difference between AI and AGI? Um, AGI is artificial intelligence that can be applied to any domain. If you take, say, AlphaGo. AlphaGo is the Google system that won the game of Go. Or if you take the Google driverless car. If you say to the driverless car computer, play me a game of Go, it's not going to play it. And if you say to the Go computer, drive my car, it's going to crash. Yeah, humans are different. With a human, you can say, I want you to play chess, let's switch, let's play go, let's switch, let's drive a car, let's switch, let's cook some food. We are general purpose intelligences. Yeah, we are AGIs, probably. Um, and that is the next step in artificial intelligence, is to, is to get us from a statistical system to a system which is general purpose intelligence. Right, so here's an interesting chart here. This is, this is the Moore's Law chart, going from 1900 to 2000. And this is 
what you get for $1,000, yeah, $1,000 computing used to get you this amount, and now it gets you that amount. But notice, this is a logarithmic scale. So every one of these divides is 100 times greater than the one above. So although this line looks almost straight, it's actually slightly accelerating, but it's almost straight, this represents an exponential growth. Yeah, this is this is more law. Every year and a half, the, or the amount of computing you get for $1,000 doubles. Okay, so humans don't think in exponential terms. We think linearly. We look at the last 10 years and we, we predict to ourselves that the next 10 years will see a similar amount of change. A lot of change in 10 years, or a lot of change in the next 10 years. But if we take that line and extend it out, it, it, does, it gets very interesting. Because you see here that now we're about this level, so for a thousand dollars we get an insect brain. Once we get to that level, which is 2030, 2035, that's a human brain. Human brain level of computational ability. Not the software, but the, but the computational complexity. For a thousand dollars, so that's an iPhone. But look at this, this is mad. 2050, that's all human brains. That's seven billion human brains for a thousand dollars. Yeah, now, even if the software lags behind and we don't build AGIs, even if all we use these things for is spreadsheets and personal assistants and machine learning models, you're going to get a very interesting level of assistance from a machine which has the computational complexity of seven billion human brains. What if this is wrong, though? What if what if this is, is drastically wrong? What if we're 10 times out? Yeah, so this is the curve that this is based upon. And this curve, I've said it goes to 1900, this curve actually goes back to the beginning of technology, if you follow it. But what if, what if we move it? We're out by a factor of, of, a, of a thousand. If we're out by a factor of a thousand, if the human brain is a thousand times more complicated than we thought, or something goes wrong in Moore's law and things slow down and we don't develop. Well, it moves it five years, ten years. Yeah. So if you're in an industry that's interested in that, ten years is a big delay. But in terms of the human race, this is going to happen. We build human brain level machines and we build them either by 2035 or by 2045. But it will happen, and we need to be prepared and think about the world that we are going to be in with this. Okay, so how to get to real AI? Well, this technical point, but the, there are some things which are missing. You don't just take machine learning systems and make them bigger and deeper and throw more data in them. The brain has structure, and the brain can do certain things. So here's the first one. Cross-domain transfer learning. That means you learn to play Go, then I take you and I say to you, now play chess. Now, you don't know chess, but as a human, you immediately recognize that this is a board game. Therefore, there are some rules. And there's some pieces. And look, it's black and white. So maybe, maybe one side is black and one side is white. So when, as a human, when you play a new game, you approach it with a set of ideas already in your head. You have transferred learning from learning to play Go to this new game. And you use that in everything in your life. That's why you can learn to drive a car in a simulator and then transfer it. You probably learn to drive a car in GTA to some extent, in computer games. When you actually go into a real car, you, you need to adapt to your behavior, but you will take some of the learning from it and apply it to the new one. Next one, one-shot learning. I can watch my father sawing a piece of wood and, and I can notice how he holds his hand, how he doesn't cut his fingers, how he does it, and I can watch him do that and then I can go and do it. With AlphaGo, yes, AlphaGo is very clever, but AlphaGo had to play a million games against itself in order to train itself to play this game. As a human, no human Go master plays a million games in their life. Yeah, so we have the ability to learn much on a much smaller data set. We can look at one thing, we can think about it, and we can learn how to do it. So that's called one-shot learning. Next one is explainability. This is an interesting topic. It's, it is demanded by a lot of legal systems. If we're going to use AI to help in the courts to decide on a prison sentence, how long, how, this murderer, how many years does this murderer get? Look at the case, look at all the factors, look at the history, the precedents. 
How many years does he get? Well, the computer says 17. Why? Yeah. A modern statistical machine learning system probably can't tell you why. They can just tell you that is the, that is the nearest answer based upon our statistical model. People want explainability. Why this candidate and not that candidate for a job? Why are we firing this person? Why are we investing in that company? So machine learning models that, that can explain themselves are very useful. I say it's interesting because humans can explain everything they do, but in reality, we're often lying. You're playing tennis, you hit the ball. Why did you hit the ball? You, what your brain, when somebody asks you the question, your brain says, what would be a logical explanation as to why I hit the ball like that? You give that explanation and now you believe it. So humans, and there's a lot of psychological research to, to back this up. Humans can explain everything they do, but quite often they're lying. Here's an interesting one, split brain experiments. You've got the brain, in the middle there's the corpus callosum, which is the, the nerves that connect the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. If you cut the corpus callosum in some epilepsy patients, then you say to a patient, you cover one eye and you show them a card which says, open the door. Now, that eye is connected to that hemisphere, so only that hemisphere knows. So this half of your brain knows open the door, this half of your brain knows nothing. So you get up and you open the door. Then we say to you verbally, why did you open the door? The auditory processing is in this half of your brain. This half of your brain doesn't know why you opened the door because it didn't see the piece of paper. But you will say, I just needed some fresh air. People do this, and what, what it is, it, 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 the term is confabulation, but it's, it's explainability. We're not explaining why we did it, we're explaining why somebody in those circumstances might have done it. But as soon as we say it, we believe it, it becomes true. So we demand explainability of computers, but we're very bad at it ourselves. And then creativity. What is, what is creativity? Can computers be creative? To me, the answer is of course they can. This is a machine, this is a, a computer, a very sophisticated computer, but it's a machine. Creativity, I think, comes from taking a lot of experience in multiple areas and mixing things together in a way that nobody has done before. And so to me, there seems no reason why computers can't do this. So these four areas, cross-domain transfer learning, one-shot learning, explainability, creativity, these are perhaps the cutting edge research areas in AI now. But these aren't deep future, these are things that are being worked on in universities around the world, in DeepMind, DeepMind in London, which is Google's AI team, is publishing papers on this, these areas all the time. So here's a question for you. Are humans AGI? I, no, is the answer. We're not quite AGIs. We are more AGI than modern computers, but even simply the fact that optical illusions work, that I can show you an optical illusion and you are fooled by it, that proves the obvious point that our perception systems and our brain are tuned for an environment, and that environment is probably the African plains. The type of things you saw in Africa 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 years ago are the type of things that the human brain is optimised for, and it is optimised only for that which is why perhaps we have a lot of problems in our society, that our psychologies are optimised for small tribal groups living in isolation in a, in a violent world where we have to kill to eat, etc. We haven't, our brains don't evolve as quickly. So I don't think it's accurate to say that humans are artificial general intelligences, but we are, well, we're not artificial general intelligences, but, but we're probably the best thing that there is on the planet now as a guide for how general intelligences might be built. There's <coughs> another question which I won't answer, but what if we succeed? What if we build AGIs? What if we build machines with the power of 8 billion human brains and that can general purpose think around anything and outthink us on everything? I, I, I don't know what world we will have if we do that. It'll never happen, they keep saying. Remember that curve, that exponential curve? This is a very short list of things that people said computers wouldn't be able to do. And in every case, the computers have been able to do them and do them better than human level. You know, recognizing images, recognizing speech, better than human level. Jeopardy is the American quiz show. IBM's machine won that a few years ago. Driverless cars, 
medical diagnoses, <coughs> translations. Now, okay, computers are not as good as, as a skilled human at translation, but they're better than an average human at translation, and that will come. It's the, it's, it's the next step. Google is spending so much money on it, it's, it's almost certain to come. So, if this field is interesting to you, which it is to me, what do you do? Okay, you can go into research, you can go to university, you can, you can go down it. And with companies like DeepMind and Facebook now hiring AI researchers, suddenly AI research is a way to make money. You can go and earn £100,000 a year, £200,000 a year working in London as a researcher in this. Data science. Okay, data science is a more general subject, but data science is it includes all of the stuff I've been talking about that is in use now. All of the statistical machine learning AI is in data science. And the UK, for instance, has a shortage of 20,000 data scientists, 20,000 data science vacancies. Out of the 100,000 IT vacancies that the country has, the Europe as a whole has 400,000 IT vacancies. So these are good careers, I think. Machine learning, it's a great buzzword, it's good on your CV, everybody will hire you for it. Most companies will hire you and then they don't know what to do with you. So it's worth asking companies, what are you going to do with this, what is your plan, and how much autonomy does the machine learning team have here? But it, but it is definitely a very popular area at the moment. Kaggle. Go to Kaggle and look at Kaggle competitions. Kaggle has loads and loads of competitions, kaggle.com, um, where they will give you a data set and a problem and it's up to you, and you can compete, you can read other people's code, you can get in. Kaggle is like, uh, I suppose, it's a bit like GitHub. GitHub for a normal developer, you will use GitHub to, as your portfolio. You say, this is me, I do good code, here, look at my code, I've done big things. Kaggle is the machine learning version of that, where people will say, here's my Kaggle profile, here are the competitions I have entered, I scored 96% on this competition, so I'm a good machine learning engineer. And I have to have a Terminator picture because all AI talks have a Terminator picture. Um, will we get a Terminator? Uh, apart from the fact the batteries will run out, I think it's kind of unlikely that we will have computers that are both super intelligent and so stupid as to be single-minded and destructive for a long period of time. Less intelligent computers, yes. So, uh, you know, I am ex-military. We had a lot of computers in our missiles, in our planes, etc. Um, when machines are more intelligent than humans, which will happen, those machines will have multiple goals. And the trick for us is, the term is value alignment. We align our values. Yeah, we build these machines to have similar values to us. Um, there are lots of talks about rules, but here are the two rules which I've heard, which I like the best. One is, the ultimate aim of machines should be to satisfy human preferences. That's, it's not to obey orders, it's to satisfy preferences. And most of us have a preference for a long, satisfying, healthy life with friends and conversation and a nice house looking over the sea, etc. Those, those preferences. And when I say human preferences, I don't mean you know, Yasser's preferences. I mean all humans. Yeah. If Yasser says, I want a big house, so destroy this town and I will have a house where the town was, the machines should be intelligent enough to say, that satisfies your preference, but it doesn't satisfy humanity's preference, so let's not do it. And the other thing is, machines should understand that humans are bad at expressing their preferences. Yeah, humans might say, this is an example from an academic paper, build paper clips, and the fear is the machine, the super intelligent machine escapes from its human captors and converts the entire Earth into a paperclip factory, and then the entire solar system, then the galaxy, eventually the universe is a paperclip factory. The, the machines should understand that when a human said to build paperclips, that was an approximation to their preferences. And in reality, their preference is going to include a lot of other things, and you should treat human preferences with suspicion. So those are my, that's my advice for the two rules for, for future AIs, is satisfy human preferences, but be suspicious of those preferences. There you go, thank you very much.